Hello there and welcome once again to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're here every week, as you know, meeting interesting people and dealing with topical issues. And today we welcome in Jim Stovall, an entrepreneur and author. Yes, I want to advise our viewers, uh, just don't leave. Don't uh -huh. turn the set down, don't leave. You're gonna be meeting a fascinating individual in Jim Stovall who has a wonderful story to tell and he lives right here in Tulsa. That's right, Jim Stovall, today's guest in The Verdict. We'll be right back. I wanted to become a princess ever since I was little. Being crowned is an amazing feeling. It means everything to me to represent my tribe, um, especially as princess. The Chickasaw Princess Program has been in existence since 1963. The leadership and the skills that we learn as being the Chickasaw Princess has been handed down from generation to generation. We're the ambassadors of the Chickasaw Nation for a year. We're a special group of ladies that have represented different governors and lieutenant governors over the years. I would tell young girls who want to become a princess just to go for it. Don't let any barriers stop you from doing what you want to do. There are some dynamic young ladies that are going to be great ambassadors for the Chickasaw Nation out there. Once a princess, always a princess, with honor and dignity. See more stories about the Chickasaw people at ProfilesOfANation.com. We want to reach out to every veteran we can in Oklahoma. There's somewhere around 340,000 veterans here in Oklahoma, and half of those are still unaware of their benefits or don't know how to go about getting them. We help guide the veterans through the VA system. It's a, it's a giant maze, and we kind of help guide them through that maze. So our job is to try to help the veterans get everything that they're legally entitled to. Uh, there's just a special place in my heart for our Vietnam veterans and our World War II veterans, as well as any veteran, and that's why I do the job. Hello there, and welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and Kent's going to introduce today's guest. As we indicated in the open, our guest today, we're really thrilled to have uh, Jim Stovall uh, come talk to us about uh, his life and the uh, things that have gone on and are going on today. Uh, Jim's background is uh, fascinating. He uh, uh, was a national Olymp Olympic weightlifting, weightlifting champion. Excuse me. He was an investment broker. He's currently president of Emmy award-winning uh, television station, Narrative TV Network. Uh, he uh, uh, was named International Humanitarian of the Year. Other folks, uh, to give you a sense of what that means, other folks such as Jimmy Carter, uh, Nancy Reagan, and Mother Teresa have received the same award as Jim has received. Uh, he uh, is uh, <clears throat> the author of 40 books, one of which is called The Ultimate Gift. Uh, that was made into a uh, hit movie, uh, and uh, I actually watched that movie, Amanda and I did, prior to doing this show, and it was a fascinating, wonderful story. Uh, uh, Jim has dealt with all this, uh, done all this, while dealing with being uh, visually impaired, and we'll get into more of that. Jim, really glad mm -hmm. to see you, glad to have you here. Well, it's an honor to be with you guys. Jim, when I look at your biography, and this is from an outsider, and I'm wondering if, if you have that, the same perspective, is that there is the, the career you had and the life you had before you went blind and then afterwards. Yeah. Do you have more of a, of a similar timeline, or do you think it's more of, a, of a, a trajectory that just started at birth? You know, I, you know, when you look back on things like this, you see more of a divine order or, or a sense of rationality. At the time, it just seemed like chaos and we pushed through. You know, I, uh, I started out in life as, as many young men here in Oklahoma wanting to be a football player. And mm -hmm. I thought that's what I would do the rest of my life. And I had the size and speed to pursue that. And the coaches and scouts were very encouraging. And then during a routine physical to go play another season of ball, I was diagnosed with uh, a condition that would cause me to lose my sight and realized very quickly there's not a lot of blind guys in the NFL. So I decided to make a career move and discovered Olympic weightlifting. And then from there, no one was gonna hire me, so I became an entrepreneur. 
Really? Yeah. And so you say you just kind of fought through it. How, how did you prepare? Well, <clears throat> I guess from being an athlete, you, you're used to, you know, you train hard, you work harder than everybody else, you keep a positive attitude, and you uh, expect mm -hmm. good things, and mm -hmm. you don't take no for an answer. So for me, that has always been what happens for me, is just outwork everybody and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pursue my passion, the things that matter to me, and that's my life. Yeah. Well, you, you said work ethic, and I didn't necessarily know we'd, we'd go here, but talk about your day. When you get up over the last few years, how does your day typically start and, and how does it, how long does it last? I get up at four o'clock every morning and people always gasp when I say that in <laughs> arena events or on the air, but uh, that's when I wake up. My alarm is set then, but it hasn't gone off in years. I always get up a couple mm. minutes before and you know, in, in doing that, I get a lot of my reading done, a lot of my study done and get ready for my day. Uh, my wife Crystal and I spend an hour together every morning um, no TV, no web, no phones, no nothing, just sit and talk. And that has revolutionized my life. And then I'm in the office at eight and I'm, I'm usually there till late afternoon, except when I'm traveling. And, uh, you know, and it, every day's a little different. I do five things. I do television, movies, books, speeches, and my syndicated columns. So it just depends on what I happen to be doing on any given day. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a pretty difficult regimen. How do you uh, keep it all straight? Well, you know, as a blind person, my life is very simple. It's, it's totally linear, so it's like, what's the next thing? And what's after that and after that? And every morning when I get to the office, we, we kind of plan my day and what am I going to do next and what am I going to do next? And uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Missy Brigham, who's here with me, she, she picked me up at the office and brought me here, and then afterwards she'll tell me what I'm doing next. I just, they just tell Jim, what's the next thing you need to do? And that, that's about it, you know. Well, you must have incredible energy. Um, I enjoy what I do. Yeah. I mean, I remember my, my first business was I was a member of New York Stock Exchange and I handled investments and I knew a guy and he, he had no, the guy could not get to work by 10 in the morning. He just, he just had no energy in anything. And I tried to get to know this guy a little better and he said, why don't we go fishing one day? And I thought, okay, if you wanna go fishing. Well, he's in my driveway at 4.30 in the morning, ecstatic <laughs> about going fishing. And I realized, okay, it's not an energy problem, it's a focus problem, it's a what is he doing? I mean, I think everybody has energy and passion for different things. Unfortunately, too many people have dedicated their lives to doing the thing that they're not passionate about. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand. Well, talk a little bit more about your weightlifting career, how that uh, it, it evolved, I guess, after you had the setback on, on your blindness. Yeah, I realized I wasn't going to pursue football anymore, and I really hadn't studied. I hadn't, you know, I'm embarrassed to tell you and your viewers that when I could read with my eyes, I don't know that I ever read a whole book like you do. Now, thanks to high-speed compressed digital audio, I read a book every day. There hasn't been a day in 28 years I haven't read a whole book cover to cover, and it changed my life. But at the time, I had no idea what I was going to do, and, uh, you know, I remember sitting at home realizing, okay, I can't play ball anymore, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, and there better be a plan for my life or, uh, you know, I just don't want to deal with this anymore. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the state fair comes to Tulsa every fall, and I'd always been playing football, so I hadn't gone and since I'd been a little kid, and I decided, okay, I need an answer today, and I'm going to go to the fair, and God and the universe better show up and give me an answer. <laughs> and I wandered around there, and there was First thing in the big exhibition building, there was a group doing a demonstration from the previous Olympic Games. And they had all the, well, I'll be honest, I went over to see the gymnasts, the young ladies, you know. <laughs> but after they, after they did their thing, they had the weightlifters come out. And I remember watching those guys, and I thought, that's something I could do even if I was totally blind. I could still do that. And three years later, I was the national champion, and I got to finish my um, career uh, as an Olympic weightlifter. And then... I went on down the Midway and they had a pavilion there, a concert hall, and it said free concert. And I didn't know who was playing or when it started, but free really fit my budget. So I went in and I sat down on the front row. There was nobody there yet. And I thought about, I'm never gonna play ball again. And I thought about those weightlifters a little bit, but I just needed to know that a blind guy could do something in this world. And then I was thinking about that so much and emotional about it and the arena filled up around me and then a voice I'll never forget said, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Tulsa State Fair, the one, the only, the legend, Ray Charles. 
And no. they brought Ray out, and he, he was as close as you and I are, Kent. And Ray was magic, and that was the beginning of my change. I, I thought, you know, if he can do that, I can do something. Now, I figured, you know, Ray's got this music thing kind of covered. I better go do something else. <laughs> but that was the beginning for me. Yeah. And you're a storyteller to a certain extent. Yeah. That's, that's kind of a different skill set, isn't it? Yeah. I, um, you know, I speak a lot. I mean, uh, you know, I do a lot of arena events and, uh, you know, just nothing but you and a microphone and a spotlight and 10,000 people. And you, you, you uh, I find that, you know, I could, I could talk about principles for the next hour or I can say it's like the Good Samaritan or... Uh, Jack and the Beanstalk or whatever and we all know these stories and we know what they're about mm -hmm. so or you know you can say it's like Titanic or whatever and people know the story so stories stick in people's minds mm -hmm. well you authored 40 books or thereabouts mm -hmm. um, are you working on one right now sure always working on a book uh, and a movie we've done 45 books now and eight movies and uh you know, I, I just love the process. I, I'm convinced whether it's William Shakespeare, or Mark Twain, or the Apostle Paul, if they were alive today, in addition to writing, they'd be making movies. Because uh, yeah. I, have, I, have, I have 10 million books in print, but it pales in comparison to the number of people that have seen the movies. Well, um, as I indicated, uh, we did watch The Ultimate Gift, and I just thought that was an ultimate gift to us to be able to watch it. Uh, it had quite a poignant story, and I'm not going to tell it on the air here, but I hope our viewers will mm -hmm. seek it out and find it. Why well, is that such a popular story, Jim? Do you, have you figured that out? Well, it dispels what I call the big lie. And the big lie is if I just had enough money in my life, everything would be great. And so I, I, I took a guy, made him a billionaire, James Garner, and he has all the money in the world, but he's ruined his family, he's ruined his life, and in the last few hours before his death, he realizes he's got one grandson he thinks has some potential, and he sends them on, him on this odyssey, and uh, I won't spoil it for people that want to read it or watch it. I will tell Kent, those of you who've watched the film, near the end, there's, there's a brief scene in the movie, you won't want to miss this, it's theatrical excellence, mm -hmm. cinematic magic is what it is, <laughs> and it's, it's me driving the limousine. <laughs> and I, I, do a, I do a part in every one of my films, uh -huh. and the first five movies, I was the limo driver, because I told them, <laughs> I'll play anything but a blind guy, and I knew they weren't going to have a blind guy driving the limo. <laughs> so that was me. Uh, let's take a break. Jim Stovall is our guest. More with Jim after this timeout. OU Law has a history and heritage that are unparalleled. At the University of Oklahoma College of Law, we empower our students to pursue the career of their dreams. We have the highest U.S. news ranking ever achieved by an Oklahoma law school. We are the first law school in the country to launch a college-wide digital initiative. And this year, our competition teams rank number two in the nation. OU Law, generations of excellence, limitless possibilities. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. That's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First, loyal to Oklahoma loyal to you. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers and our guest is Jim Stovall. During the break you were telling us how you got 
Jim Garner uh, to be a star of, of one of your more famous movies, The Ultimate Gift. Well, uh, originally I wanted Paul Newman to do that, and because of my work on narrative TV, I've interviewed a lot of classic film stars, uh, uh, Jimmy Stewart, Katherine Hepburn, Frank Sinatra, and Mr. Newman was one of them. So when Fox told me they wanted to turn The Ultimate Gift into a movie, I loved the idea of having Paul Newman do it, so I called him, and he had read the book, but he said, you know, my health's not good enough, and he said, plus I promised Redford I'd do my last film with him, and I said, Mr. Newman, I wouldn't do this for anybody but you, but if you'll come do the movie, I'll, I'll write a part in for Redford. I'll put, I'll put him right in the movie, too. I said, no, I can't pay him. You'll need to pay him out of your share, but, but anyway, but when it came down to it, his health really didn't permit him to, and our casting people out in L.A. said, what about James Garner? And I was really embarrassed because fellow Oklahoman and on the, on the centennial, uh, he and I were both selected as the 100 something. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had met him, huge fan of this guy. And I thought, why didn't I think of that? So I called him and they said, would you be willing to do this? And he said, I love it. He said, I've been doing this 50 years and this story says what I want to say for my last film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, now I, I, don't, I don't want to be a difficult situation between us. I don't want any animosity. You may hear that I offered it to Newman. And he said, son, I got rich and famous doing stuff Newman don't want to do. Let's make the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's how I got Mr. Garner. Um, the Narrative TV Network, which uh, you, you own and, and started, uh, tell us about that. What, what's the scope? Well, as I told you, I was diagnosed as a young man. I was going to lose my sight, and it progressively got worse through my 20s. And at age 29, I woke up, and I was totally blind. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I moved into this little room in the back of my house, and it had my radio and telephone and my tape recorder. And I thought I would live the rest of my life in this 9 by 12 foot room. I didn't know what I was going to do. And the only thing that was in that room before I lost my sight, that was our TV room. So it had a TV and a video player over there and my collection of classic movies. And, you know, I had Casablanca and John Wayne movies and all these different things. And one day out of just sheer boredom, sitting in my little self-imposed prison there, I put on one of those old movies. I thought, you know, I have seen this film so many times. I'll just be able to listen to this and kind of follow along. And, and it worked for a while. You know, it was a Humphrey Bogart film called The Big Sleep. And, you know, and it worked, but then somebody shot somebody and somebody screamed and the car sped away and I got really frustrated and I said the magic words. I said, somebody ought to do something about that. And that's when you know you've had a great idea. The whole world's praying for a great idea and they trip over one about three times a week. The only thing a great idea is go through your life and wait for something bad to happen and say, how could I have avoided that? And the only thing you got to do to turn your great idea into a great business is say, how could I help other people avoid that? And a little research told me there's 13 million blind and visually impaired people here in the United States, and TV and movies is the most popular recreational form we have. Whether that's good or bad is a whole other show, but it's true. And uh, I realized by putting an extra soundtrack in between the dialogue of those characters, um, we could make TV and movies accessible. So we started and uh, um, started here on cable right here in Tulsa and grew and grew and. Uh, now, all primetime programming is narrated, and most first-run movies are, and it's, it's, it's everywhere now. And it, uh, you know, and everybody at home watching us now, there, there's a button on your TV you probably never use called Second Audio Program, SAP, or Languages, or depending on the model of your TV. And if you push that button during primetime and you're on one of the major networks, you'll, you'll hear these soundtracks we create. Well, uh how much of your day is taken up with the narrative TV network? Um, well, I, I have very good people that work in a studio here on South Memorial, and a lot of their day, you know, I just yeah. kind of go through the schedule now and do that. I mean, in the beginning, I was the narrator, and, uh, and uh, you know, I don't want to get into all the gory details, but if anybody out there is thinking about a career move and you want to be a narrator, all you got to do is be able to read the script and watch the screen, but since I couldn't do that, I was not a premier narrator. So. <laughs> We had to get some people in that could see. <laughs> well, what are you doing now? I mean, what, uh, what's your attention focused on well, primarily? Well, I think, you know, I, I've always got a couple of books and a movie going, but I think my next big thing here in Tulsa is uh, the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship at ORU. And it, it started 40 years ago. I was a 19-year-old sophomore in a chapel at ORU, and they had a guy come that uh, his life's work was to dig water wells in Africa. and it, at the end of the chapel, Oral said, you know, we ought to take up a collection and help this man. And 
I had $17 in the whole world, and it was in my pocket. I had a 10 of 5 and two ones. That was my life savings. So I decided, okay, I'm going to give this guy a dollar. And as the collection basket gets like one or two people away from me, Oral said, stop, somebody needs to hear this. Either give your best and expect the best or keep your money because you're probably going to need it. And it. So I threw my $10 bill in there, which um, created another crisis for me because now I was down to seven bucks and I had a date with Miss Crystal then, who is now my wife of 38 years. But at that time, we weren't exactly a couple, if you know what I mean. And a $7 date was not going to win the day. <laughs> so um, I went out after night and I said, um, you know, I said, I got good news, bad news. I helped the man with the water wells, but we're getting ready to have a $7 date. And she said, well, why don't we eat in the dining room and then go for a walk? And I calculated that real quick. And I said, okay, I can do that. And we got to an empty classroom there at the grad center on the campus of ORU. And she said, what do you think we're going to do when we get out of college? And that was encouraging because there'd never been a we in any of our conversations. <laughs> so I picked up on that immediately. So I, I could still see at that point a little bit. So I got up and I started writing on the board. And I said, well, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm going to write a book and they're going to make a movie. And I wrote down all these things. Every one of them happened except for the last one. I said, someday I'm going to find something I care as much about as that guy cares about those water wells and I'm going to give him a million bucks. And for a guy with seven bucks in his pocket, that's kind of bold. <laughs> well, a year ago, spring, I was in a board meeting at ORU, a two-day board meeting, and our assignment was, what do you think ORU should be doing in the year 2030? And uh, somebody threw out the idea, we should have an undergrad and a graduate school on entrepreneurship. And, you know, there were dozens of ideas. I'm sure they're gathering dust in a file somewhere, but I couldn't get away from that all last summer. And I called Dr. Wilson, the president, and I said, uh, come out to the house and here's my vision and my idea. And if you like it, I'll give you a million dollars. And uh, actually, by the time he added his vision to mine, it's now a million and a half dollars, but who's counting? So uh, I'm really excited and we start some of the activities this fall and we'll be fully open and operational with an undergrad program uh, fall of 2020 at the Stovall Center for Entrepreneurship. Uh, Jim, we have uh, entitled this show or it has a one word title, Perseverance. Yeah. Uh, obviously you've had to persevere uh, through some very difficult times to accomplish what you've accomplished. Uh, how does that, the, the feeling of perseverance or willingness to accept it uh, instilled in you? Was it uh, something you developed yourself or is it something you think you've had for a long time before you had any sight I, difficulty? I remember you know, a lot of it comes from sports and athletics, but a lot of it, I remember, you know, when I went to see a doctor and my parents sent me to see this specialist down in Florida, and, you know, he, he told me, you're going to be blind and, you're, you know, you're not going to have an ordinary life. And I came back and my mom and dad asked, what do you say? And, you know, I broke down and I, you know, 17 year old kid. And I said, he says, I'm not going to be normal. And my dad said, well, being normal is nothing worth aspiring to. He said, just go do something extraordinary. And, uh, you know, and I just, um, you know, the, the audacity to believe that something good can happen and you just don't give up. I mean, I, you know, a lot of people have a lot of options in their life. They could go do hundreds of things. I don't. I can do what I do. And so I had to create a little world that works for me. And, uh, and I'm not willing to give it up. I'm pretty serious about it. That's going to have to be the final word. Jim, thanks so much for coming on the show. Great to be with you yeah, both. Thank yeah. you. You guys are wonderful. All right. And Kent and I will have a final word when we return. It used to be okay in hospitals. It used to be okay in movie theaters. It was okay in classrooms, restaurants, and airplanes. But thanks to a greater understanding of the dangers, that's not okay anymore. So now that we know secondhand smoke causes lifelong health problems, why is it still okay to smoke with children in the car? Bottom line, it's not okay. Let's get serious about protecting kids. Join the fight at stopswithme.com. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system.
For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. You will always be mom and dad to me. We have uh, uh, children come from a different lifestyle, different mindset. You have to open your arms and really do what you have to do to have that child become a part of your family. And if it's more patience, that's what you do. Kids got to know they can trust you. And that's what we've tried to do with these kids. You will always be mom and dad to me. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're wrapping up the show with Jim Stovall. Yeah, very inspiring show. Very, uh, it's my first time to meet Jim, but he is a wonderful human being with a lot of uh, fantastic mm -hmm. accomplishments under the most difficult circumstances. And I don't, we obviously have not heard the last of him, so uh, viewers, we'll have him back. Yeah, do, do a little research on the internet, and you can see all, a lot of information on Jim. And uh, Kent mentioned he just watched one of the movies, The Ultimate Gift. And if you and your family have never seen that, it's, it's a wonderful story about some values that I'm sure you'd appreciate. We have some website information, how you can get more information about today's guest. You can go to jimstovall.com, that's J-I-M-S-T-O-V-A-L-L.com. And we have a website. It's theverdict.tv. You can log on and talk about a program you'd like to see us air in the future or a guest you'd like to see us visit. And I hope we have Jim Stovall back on. In a well, we will. Show. I can assure you we will. Yeah, Jim's a great guest, and we appreciate him coming on today. Again, our website, theverdict.tv. We'd love to have an idea about a future show that you'd like to see. That's going to do it for this week's show. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next week right here on The Verdict.